thing that's kind of like fax machines is that people, there's some people that still like network television, but it better be really good network television. And I think that's why our magazine has lasted for 42 years is because we do have a very good magazine. And the reason that we have a good magazine is not necessarily what Sally and I do, but it's because we have incredible writers. So if all of y'all know our magazine, y'all all realize that our magazine is written primarily about 90% of the writers that write for our magazine are AgriLife Extension agents, right? How many people know Greg Grant? How many people have heard of Greg Grant? Dr. Bill Welch. Yeah, all of these people write for our magazine and they are truly the leading voices of horticulture in the state. And so, like I say, we like Master Gardeners, we like the AgriLife program. And before I forget, Y'all all are aware that as, as Master Gardeners, you get a 25% discount at our magazine, right? So if you've got something to write on or just keep it in mind or just call Sally and us, we have a code and it's, I'll have to look it up. We do have a code on the website that you can type in and get a 25% discount on a one year subscription. So that is really, really, I think a great thing that we do for the Master Gardeners. I don't know if y'all realize it, but in our magazine every month, we have a section in the back that's called Little Green Thumbs. Have y'all, the folks that, that get it, have y'all seen that segment? And so I heard people talking about it earlier and that uses the Junior Master Gardener curriculum. And it's a little section that we did. The first thing that Sally and I did was we put that in and it's a thing that encourages people to get outside with their little loved ones, whether they're your children, your grandchildren, just kids you're working with, get them outside, get them off the computers and get them, get them growing stuff, okay? And then the other thing that we did is we featured every issue that we had, now we ran out, but for every issue for several years, we featured the pro projects that you guys were doing. And so we really do love y'all and we appreciate every one of y'all. I guarantee 40 to 50% of our subscribers come from y'all. So thank you very much for supporting our magazine. If you're not getting it, go to the website and get your 25% discount. I tell people that our magazine is cheaper than three blizzards. Okay, three blizzards from Dairy Queen. 1871 is what your one year subscription is and a blizzard is six dollars. So literally a whole year of gardening for the cost of three blizzards. All right, tonight we're gonna talk about pest-free organic. Now, if you know our magazine, the reason that I have this up here is that our magazine, what keeps our magazine, I think, relevant is that we do not have stories in here about the three-lobed bell pepper. Have y'all seen that? So several years, it's just sweet social media, and they were saying that if you had a three-lobed bell pepper, that was a male, and those were good for cutting up and putting in a salad, but if you had a four-lobed bell pepper, those were female, and those were better for cooking. Well, it was a lie. It was a complete and total lie. There was absolutely no truth to it whatsoever. There is no such thing as a male or female bell pepper. A bell pepper is simply a, a sexual organ that contains the seeds that will produce plants that may be male, may be female, may be male and female, okay? But my point is that there's a lot of bad horticultural information out there on the website. And so I tell people, if you're going to be a gardener, and if you're going to be a serious gardener, we have a ton of stats about our magazine. The average reader of Texas Gardener spends at least five hours a week in their garden, which to me is a lot. That's, that's a pretty active hobby, okay? If you're going to be doing it, you're serious about it, you want the best information available. And that's why all of our writers pretty much come from the AgriLife ranks. So lots of science and agriculture. and and we are proud to be able to bring that to you. All right, so tonight we're gonna to talk about organic pest control. I call this presentation Pest Free Organically, and it's truly one of my favorite presentations to give. It's also the one that I like to talk the most about, so I will be watching Sally to give me the, the hammer. So what does organic mean? So in my opinion, organic means a lot of things to a lot of people, but it's the simplest form, organic gardeners they're more defined by what they don't do necessarily than what they do do. And so what they do not like is they do not like to use synthetic fertilizers, they do not like to use synthetic herbicides, and they do not like to use synthetic pesticides. Now, we'll talk about each one of those. I think all of these things have a place. 
Um, I just want you to know how many people are on earth right now. Anybody? Oh, oh, and I almost forgot. Man, I get excited. So I like people to participate. And so I will ask questions and I have prizes. So if you participate in my discussion, I will hand to you a pack of Osmocote. All right, how many people are familiar with Osmocote? So the way each one of these is enough to fertilize a five inch pot for six months. This is good stuff. So participate. So if I ask a question, just give me an answer. If you're right, I'm going to give you Osmocote. If you're wrong, I'm still going to give you Osmocote. Okay? <laughs> so participate, participate, participate. And for those that participate, at the end, Osmocote's our biggest sponsor. Okay, so Osmocote has come out with a new line of things for your pot plants called Pot Shots, and they're only available online. And they're basically um, they take their their potted their fertilizer and they turn them into little spikes, and then you just simply put them in your house plants and it, it feeds your house plants for six months. You can only get them online. And so at the end, how many people got one of our magazines? Did you pick one of our magazines up for it? The answer to the grand prize is in that magazine. All right? So I'll even give you a further hint. It's in the editorial. So I'm going to ask here in a little bit a question, and whoever's the first one to get it gets to take these pot shots home. Okay? So they're awesome. All right. So let's talk about organic things. What are the most or important organic principles? Now, I have a master's degree in horticulture. All right, I, I have a bachelor's degree in agronomy. So I have studied some of these things and I have you know, my feelings and my opinions. And I will tell you this, at my house, I run my vegetable gardens 100% organic. Okay, now I don't garden organically necessarily because you know, I think it's the only way to garden. I garden organically because I learned to garden from my grandparents from my aunts and my uncles and some other people that taught me how to garden organically. And people were gardening organically in the country many, many years ago. Okay, Organic gardening is cool and hip and hot and all right now. But back in the days when my grandparents were doing organic gardening, they were trying to eat. They were trying to feed a family and they didn't have money to spend on organic fertilizers, organic pesticides and things like that. And so they learned how to garden organically. And people have always gardened organic. So just real fun for an Osmocote. How many people are on the earth right now? How many? Okay, we're going to go, you get Osmocote, and you get Osmocote. So let's just say between 7 and 8 billion people, all right? Now, for some more Osmocote, who wants to tell me what was the most pressing scientific and agricultural issue in 1900. What? Well, that was a that was a farmer's almanac was around. That was a source for information. But when all of the Nobel laureates got together and they were talking about what they were going to do to improve the world in the 20th century, what do you think was the biggest um, problem that they faced? Yes, ma'am. Ding, 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 ding. Fertilizer. Okay. Before 1900, in the world, guess where all the fertilizer came from? Where? Well, it came from, let's say animals. Let's start with animals. Did you have, you have fertilizer? Okay. So, before 1900, there was no such thing as synthetic agriculture. There was no such thing as synthetic fertilizers, okay? The majority of the bagged fertilizer products that the Europeans were using to extend their harvests and everything came from two islands off of Peru. And these islands were stopover places for migratory birds that had been stopping there and pooping for millions of years. And they had created two poop islands, giant poop islands. And these people would go and they literally fought wars. They tried to you know, invade Peru and take control of this poop because this poop was so valuable, because it's all they had. In fact, at that point in 1900, there were one million people on the planet, and they realized that that store of organic nitrogen was running out, and the people were gonna start, start uh, starting death, but they didn't figure something out, okay? 
So when I talk about organics and I talk about synthetics, know that I understand fully that the earth cannot support 7 billion people without synthetic agriculture, okay, without modern science. But here's what I tell people, and we're getting real close to the pot shots, okay? So Sally and I have two guiding principles that we got that guide us in the snack room. Two things that we truly believe. The first thing that we believe is we believe in the thing that we believe, we say gardening matters, okay? Gardening matters. How many people do you think garden in the state of Texas? Well, not enough. You get more. Okay. Not enough. But let me tell you, if you base it on national studies, one in four households in the United States claim to do some kind of gardening. Now, that gardening can be house plants, it can be a yard, it can be growing some trees and all that. But one in four households in the United States claim to be actively involved in gardening. That's a bunch of folks. That's a bunch of folks in Texas, okay? And so Sally and I have things that we really are concerned about. We're concerned about water. As I know, if you're in the Austin area, you're very concerned about water, okay? So we believe that as gardeners, gardening matters, okay? If there are millions of us here, and we all collectively got together and do something, we can make a difference, okay? We truly can make a difference. And so if we want to save the pollinators, right? That's kind of the hot new buzzword right now. Everybody's fired up about the pollinators, right? Well, why are they fired up about the pollinators? <laughs> what? Because of the but what are those synthetic products doing to them? They're killing them, right? They're killing these things. And so we do have to. So Sally and I, first and foremost, we believe gardening matters. So we, we applaud each and every one of y'all for being Master Garden because we think what you do is important to not just your community, but to your world. And then the other thing that we do, that we believe in our magazine, in our editorial, we have something that we say all the time. And this is how we sign off with our editorials. And this is the other thing that we believe in. We believe that gardening should be fun. Yes, ma'am. What do you think our catchphrase is for the magazine? Plant happiness, all right? Here we go. Thank you. We believe that gardening matters and gardening should be fun. So that's why I run this as a game show. It should be fun. Gardening is fun, right? Okay, so now we're gonna talk about these principles. Now, the reason I told you that is because this is what gardeners believe. If you want to be an organic gardener, you don't want to use anything synthetic in your garden, right? So that is true. I try not to do that. I do not do that in my vegetable gardens, but I do put out synthetics in my yard and in some of my ornamental beds, I will put out some, some supplemental fertilizer, okay? What I believe is that if you are going to try to be as organic as what some people would call practical, then you want to avoid at all costs herbicides, and pesticides, okay? But I give people some room, some fudge factor on fertilizer. Because I'm gonna ask y'all a fun little fact, okay? A fun little, little kind of a trick question, all right? True or false, plants use nitrogen. False, okay? Plants use nitrogen in the form of a nitrate or a nitrite. So a plant cannot take up nitrogen by itself. It has to be bonded to an oxygen molecule for the plant to take it up and use it. So that was a trick question. You get two osmocotes for answering the trick, trick, trick question. However, we all know that we have to have nitrogen. Nitrogen's an important thing, but the plant cannot tell if it's NO3 or it's NO2 came from a plant in China or if it comes from decomposing microorganisms in your soil. Okay, so that's why I tell people, if you want to, if you want to use fertilizer, I don't think people should have a guilt about that because chemically the plant cannot tell the difference between a commercially built fertilizer or an organic fertilizer. Now I know that's not always the same, the whole answer. Okay, I mean I know that some of these commercial fertilizers are very bad on giving trace elements and things like that. So I always tell people, you know, the best program in my opinion, especially in a food garden is an organic program because the organic program, this is one of my favorite sayings, y'all, good gardeners grow plants, all right? Great gardeners grow soil. 
And that's what we believe. And that's what we're going to talk about here. And we'll see how that all plays in. But great gardens grow soil microbes. If you grow, if you give things, I tell people, where do your plants live? Where do they live? They live in the soil, right? So that's their house. That's their home, right? And so if you give somebody a warm, nurturing environment that has all of their needs met, what are they going to do? They're going to thrive. Okay, it's the same with people. I tell us, people and plants, we're not too much different. So, avoid pesticides, avoid herbicides, and if you want to occasionally use commercial fertilizers, that's okay, all right? And we're going to talk about why we're going to avoid these things as we get through here. Now, one thing that I used to say when I started doing this, this presentation a long time ago, and I'd say, what do you think organic pest control means? And people say, oh, it means you got a lot of bugs, okay? And I'm like, ah, ha, 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 funny, funny, okay. Well, it doesn't have to mean that. So when I was at A&M, one thing that I got the opportunity to do was I got to work in the A&M greenhouses. How many people have ever been in a greenhouse, been to a greenhouse? Let me tell you, if you've not been to a greenhouse, I highly recommend going. And if you have, like, youth that you work with or whatever, take youth to a greenhouse. Because a greenhouse is science on steroids. Okay, so these people are cranking out massive, massive amounts of plants on a daily, daily basis, and they are doing it in a place that is ripe for disease. All right, but they keep their disease under control by using a thing called the integrated pest management system. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. But the reason greenhouses, everybody used to think when I used to go to these greenhouses early on, people would say, Oh. Greenhouses are wasting water, and oh, greenhouses, they spray every chemical in the world, blah, 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 blah. And greenhouses got a bad rep. And I'm going to tell you, that's not true today, all right? If you go to most greenhouses, they have a well drilled on site, and they have retention ponds to capture their overspray, which goes back into the aquifer and refeeds it. But they also stop spraying herbicides and pesticides. And you know why? Anybody want to guess why they stop spraying them? What? Ding, 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 ding. You get two awesome codes for that. So when I used to go to Sunday school, they said the answer is always love. If somebody asks you a question in Sunday school and you don't know the name, say love. Okay, that's always going to be the right answer. And the rest of the world, if you don't know the answer and somebody asks you why something is, the answer is money. Okay? Money is what rules the world. So the reason that greenhouses no longer spray a lot of herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and things like that is because it costs money. How many people know how those greenhouses work? When you send that truckload of money, or that truckload of plants to Walmart, did Walmart write that grower a check? No, they did not. What happened? So, sorry, consignment. It is on consignment, right? So if that truck gets there and the high school kids that work at Lowe's take it off and don't water it for three or four days and they all die, guess how much money that grower got? That grower got zero, okay? And so because of that, they have to run a very tight ship. So they have to make a lot of products as cheap as possibly, and all of these chemicals cost money. So they try to abide a number one for money, but then a while back, people got more concerned about the things that they put in their mouths and the things that they put in their gardens, and they began to realize that there were some, probably some residual effects from these herbicides and pesticides, and now the general public does not like herbicides and pesticides. So what those growers found out is that if they will put sustainably grown, an organically grown tag in their pansy, then they can take that pansy from Walmart and divert it to Whole Foods, and they can sell that 29 cent pansy for 4.29. Okay, and so that right there is why greenhouses got away from pests. But like I said, greenhouses are a place that is just the perfect environment for pests, right? Because what does a pest need? And let's just pick a pest. What does a weed need? A weed needs water, light, sunlight, temperature, basically no freezing weather, right? Okay, have you got awesome code? There we go. So, about the same thing we need. So, in a greenhouse, 
those people have that 365 days a year. You know, at least here, every once in a while, they'll kind of freeze and they'll kill some bug eggs or whatever. But it never kills a bug egg in a greenhouse because it's, you know, 78 degrees year-round. So anyway, so greenhouses use a thing called IPM. You can use IPM in your garden as well. And we're going to talk about this. This is how you're going to organically control pests in your garden. So there's many things that are represented by a triangle. And what they mean is the thing that is the base, the biggest, is the alleys at the bottom of the triangle. So you have your cultural methods. The next, you're going to have your mechanical and physical methods. And then at the top, you'll have your chemical and your biological controls. So the first thing that we're going to tell people here, if you want to grow a healthy, pest-free garden, then you need to do these few things right here. Remember, these are your cultural control methods. These are the base of your program. So the first thing that you want to do is you want to grow healthy plants and healthy soil. All right? So somebody told me that they just moved into, who were we talking about, that it just moved into a new um, subdivision. There you go, right there. And that subdivision has soil that was probably brought in. Okay, so this soil has not been in place for a long time. It's not been built and all that. So I wouldn't call that a healthy soil. You're going to need to work that soil. You're going to need to work organic material in. So you want to grow healthy plants and healthy soil. All right? So I tell people, whenever you buy anything horticultural, there are two things that you should do. Anybody want to guess what the two things you should do every time you buy anything horticultural? And what? Look at it. Okay, so like let's say we're gonna buy that pansy, all right? Turn it upside down, take the pot off and look at the roots. Is that pansy root down? Is that pansy soft and wet and all of a sudden it smells a little funny and everything and all of a sudden you know it's got root rot because it's been sitting in water for too long. Right? So take everything out, examine it, look at it. And the second thing is, is it has a tag or a label, read it, okay? And I'm not being silly here. Somebody got a PhD to write that tag or write that label. And I'm not making that up. Everything that you need, somebody got a PhD. When I said A&M, how many people grow Angelonia? Angelonia, it's a great, great water. And it doesn't need a lot of water. It's just a hearty, hearty plant. There was a young lady doing her PhD research on literally how little water you could give to an Angelonia and keep it alive. Now, why do you think she was doing that? What? Yes, ma'am. Ding, 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 ding. In fact, that winning answer gets two awesome notes because she was doing it to put the label in the plants, but the Angelonia producers, they wanted to know that because they didn't ever want to ship a truckload of Angelonias to one of the big box stores and not have anybody water it for three days and have a whole loss of that, that, that plant, right? So all that information on there is very, very good. And another reason you should read that information, as gardeners, what do we love? You know, we love the new stuff. We like the showy stuff, right? We want to try to grow all of this cool, exotic stuff. Does anybody remember what happened last February, 11 months ago? What happened? We learned what happened when you don't read plant tags, right? And what happened? Lots and lots of plants die. Now, when I say, could we have avoided that if we would have paid attention to that plant tag? You, you most probably could because that plant tag would tell you what USDA hardiness zones this plant grows in. So you can always stretch a zone a little bit, you know, but I can tell you, north of I-10, oranges don't do too well. Okay? I mean, it's just the way it is. It is their genetics. Now, now you can cover them, you can give them some things, and there are people that can grow oranges all the way up into the Dallas Fort Worth area, but they're rare. As a general rule, you don't want to get attached to your citrus fruits if you live north of I 10. And we all live north of I 10, right? So, that's just one of those things. Grow crops recommended for your area. Another thing that you want to do is practice crop rotation. Who wants to guess? Outside of ants, what is the most populous living organism on the planet? Who, who said, wait, I heard the N word. Who said it? 
Ding, 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 ding. How did you know that, sir? Nematodes, nematodes, nematodes. The most, they are on every continent except for Antarctica. Now, who can tell me, what is a nematode? Why, why are these rascals bad? Why am I bringing these up? How many people have ever grown a tomato? How many people have ever grown okra? How many have ever pulled up an okra plant at the end of the year and looked at their roots? Their roots have got big knots all over them, and that is not nitrogen nodules. Okay, those are nematodes. Those are nematodes that are killing that plant or depriving that plant of the water and the nutrients that it needs. So they're a horrible, horrible pest for gardeners. The only way to get around those is to move your crops around. Find out what crops are susceptible to them. So anything in the potato family, the tomatoes, the potatoes, the eggplants and all of that, okra, don't grow that in the same place more than three years. So grow it on this side of your garden for three years, then move it all the way to the other side for three years, okay? So that's how you're gonna control your nematodes. The other thing, control weeds. Who has ever heard the saying, one year of weeds, or one year of seeds equals seven years of weeds? You heard that? Well, just from hearing that, I'm gonna give you some awesome okay? So that is a, that is, that is not even a true statement. How much time have I got there? 40 minutes. Oh, I still got 40 minutes? Oh, I'm going I'm to slow down. <laughs> All right. So, how many people have heard of bindweed? There's two bindweeds in the state of Texas. There's purple bindweed and there's white bindweed. What is it? Ding, 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 ding. Ding, 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 ding. Now, how do you know it's a morning glory? Very good. That's a good enough answer for me. So this is one thing I do tell people, and as master gardeners, I think you'll get exposed to it and you'll learn. People are always like, how do you learn all this stuff about how to grow this plant and how to grow that plant? Don't focus on learning how to grow a plant. Focus on how to learn how to grow plant families, okay? Because all the things in the plant families are going to have Similar characteristics, okay? So if you look at a bindweed, its genus is Ipomea, okay? Same thing as a morning glory. Same thing as a sweet potato. So it's in that same genus, okay? So that's how you know that bindweed is the native Texas morning glory. AM has done research, and it's not over yet, but they have dug up bindweed seeds that have been buried for 27 years and they still germinate. Okay? So the reason I tell you this is that if you want to successfully control weeds in your garden organically, you're gonna have to stay on top of it. Okay? So if you never wanna have vine weed again, that means you're gonna have to pick every little vine weed shoot that pops up for the next at least 27 years, right? <laughs> And I mean, and vine weed's not the only plant like that. There are other very noxious weeds. I mean, um, nutsedge. It's horrible. It's almost, it's almost impossible to eradicate, but it can be done. So control your weeds. Do not let weeds go to seed. That's, that's plain and simple. And the reason we'll talk about how important that is, but we'll talk about some ways that they do go to seed, how to get that under control in a few slides. And then water in the morning. The water in the morning, that's kind of, you know, to keep funguses down and everything. If you're going to overhead spray, first of all, I don't recommend overhead spray anyway, but I understand some people do that. You know, that, that's fine. This is America, right? You can water your plants any way you want to water, right? But don't, I don't like overhead spray anyway. I like drip irrigation. But if you do overhead spray, the reason they say spray in the morning, why? What? Yes, ma'am. Who has Osmico? You have some? Here we go. I heard from both y'all. Okay. Let it dry in the morning because one thing Texas has got plenty of is heat, right? And so a lot of these pests, they like moisture, especially funguses. Okay. So that's why they say water in the morning, let it dry out all day. All right. Other cultural control things. Plant many types of vegetables as opposed to a single type. Now here's a true story. This is, this, and this is why I love gardening. Okay, if I think gardeners are problem solvers and they're just curious people, and so I've gardened 
most of my life. I've been around garden almost all my life. One year, my wife and I, we love to decorate our front porch, and we love to decorate our house with things we grow. Okay, so every fall we grow corn, and we cut the corn stalks, and we grow gourds, and we grow pumpkins, and, and all of that. So one year we decided that we wanted a bunch of those ornamental gourds or squash, like you'll see at HEB, and you know, they'll be in the little nylon bag, and they're a dollar a piece or whatever. So we wanted a bunch of those. So I went in my garden, and I planted a 50-foot row of all these different squashes. So Turk's turban, and um, big red warty thing, and you know, all of these different attractive little squashes that we were gonna pick and, and decorate the house with. Once those, that row flowered, I had a little green and black bug show up that I'd never seen in my life. And within three days, so many of those little green and black bugs had shown up that they'd eaten every flower off of that 50 foot row of squash and they were eating the leaves, they were eating the stems, and I'd never seen them. And they turned out to be cucumber beetle, okay? And cucumber beetle, y'all have it here. Y'all have it in the Austin area, you know, just, just like I do. It is a horrible, voracious pest, all right? But the reason, if I was a cucur or if I was a squash grower, okay, that pest would wipe me out, right? So that's why they tell people, you know, plant many varieties of vegetables. That way you can't be wiped out by a single pathogen, a single pest, a single weed, or, or whatever. Another thing it says is to space plants properly. And some of these things work in conjunction with each other. Now, how do you know how, how much space you need to give a plant? The, the tag. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> the tag. You read that tag, right? Now, I will tell you what. One thing that I have seen, one of the biggest problems I see people do with their tomatoes, is if you're not familiar with growing tomatoes, a lot of people don't understand how, just how big these plants get, okay? And I mean, there are some plants that literally will grow six foot in diameter, six, eight feet tall. So if you planted those two plants three feet apart, because you, you know, the general recommendation on tomatoes is three feet apart, and that might work on celebrity, but it will not work on some of these heirlooms and all, which are all bush and no tomato. And you know, they're just gonna grow and grow. So if you have a tomato that gets six foot in diameter and you plant them three foot apart, what's gonna happen? They're gonna crowd each other out. And when they crowd each other out, it's gonna do several things. It's gonna invite several different pathogens in, okay? And it's also gonna stop the biological process. This is what I tell people, when you're gardening, think of the biological processes. So how many people know Dr. Jerry Parsons? Dr. Jerry Parsons, he's been around forever. He's just a hoot. He, I love to listen to Dr. Parsons talk. He does not like eggplant, okay? And so his favorite joke when he's given a vegetable presentation, he says, if somebody makes you grow eggplant, plant it in the shade, because then it won't set any flowers and you won't get any eggplant, okay? So if you plant these tomatoes too close together, not only is that going to make them not get the proper airflow, which is not going to let the water dry out, it's also going to shade them and it's going to prevent pollination because tomatoes are self-pollinating for one. And so if they don't get enough flowers to pollinate each other, you're not going to get any tomatoes. Okay? So it's good for pest free, but it's also good just for general growing practice. Okay? So what else have we got? Okay. Clean up mulch and debris. How many people at the end of the growing season go into your garden with your rake and a big old bag and clean up <laughs> all the spent stuff that's in there, right? How many people grow tomatoes? Almost everybody grows tomatoes. Just for fun, 86% of the gardeners that respond to a survey say they grow tomatoes. Most grown tomato in, in the world, okay? What is a, a problem that happens to tomatoes on their lower limbs. Have y'all, who's heard of blight? Yeah, early blight, like late blight, right? So what happens to early and late blight? It gets in there and it kills the lower limbs, the lower leaves, and, and they'll fall off and all. Well, all of that stuff that lays on top of the ground, it is infected, it has disease. So if you don't keep that cleaned up, there's a good chance, especially if you're doing a, a top water spray on it, that you're gonna spread that, that disease. So that's why you want to get it cleaned up.
But at the end of the year, you also want to clean it up. So last March, after going through that horrible February, my wife and I were sitting out on our back porch. We've got a screened in porch. Now this is early March after the, the freeze had gone away. And we're sitting back there drinking coffee. And all of a sudden we see fully grown red wasps flying around. And we're like, how on earth did those red wasps survive five degrees for five days? Because that's what we had in front of them. We had five degree weather for, for five days. Well, the way those red wasps survive and the way that other pests survive is they survive under the debris in your garden, in your soil. So all of that mulch that we tell you to put in there, if it's too woody, if it's hay or things like that, and you're not cleaning it up, that is where a lot of these vectors will get and they will overwinter. Okay, so give them enough protection to get them through the winter. So you need to clean up every year. You need to sanitize your tools. You need to sanitize your pages with a 1% bleach solution. All right, now we're going to move on to the next thing, mechanical and physical control. So the base of our program is, are these cultural practices. All right, so yes, ma'am. You can Oh yeah, you always have you always have to but clean it up first, okay? Especially like on the tomatoes and things like that that have dropped a bunch of foliage and all that. Because as it gets hot in Texas, your tomatoes start looking pretty bad, right? And so they start to lose their lower limbs, their leaves, and all of that. And you don't want to leave that stuff down there. So just give it a light ray. Um, a lot of the mulches that are, are really bad are coarse wood mulches, like wood chips. That's where a lot of the bugs will get in. And so I tell people, rake that stuff up that's still there, because by the time you put it down, when should you be mulching your vegetable? Or when should you mulch in any of your gardens? After I say mulch your gardens now. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, you will need to pull that back or whatever. But the reason I tell people to start mulching your gardens now is because it's colder, it's cooler, your biological processes are a little bit slower right now, but you want to go ahead and you want to get that out there because we're going to go through a wet part. And one of the things, what is the difference for the last two osmocotes? Oh, I got three osmocotes. So for three osmocotes, who can tell me what is the difference between mulch and compost? Ding, 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 I'm going to give you that. So my answer, the difference between mulch and compost is six months. Okay? That's the difference between mulch and compost. So if you put your mulch out right now, anything that is in touch in that in touch, you know, that touches the soil, it's going to get wet. The organisms in the soil are going to start working it out. By the time you're done with your tomatoes, because here your big tomatoes are going to be done by July 4th. Okay? So then you go and you rake up whatever's left of the big chunks of the wood mulch or whatever. Or if you mulch with hay, get rid of all that hay. I mean, get rid of it. You know, don't set it aside and put it back in your yard. You know, take it to the dump, take it to the landfill, because it's full of bug eggs. It's full of bug eggs. It's full of funguses. It's full of any bacteria. okay? So anything big like that, then you go back with more mulch. Mulch is a continual process. Mulch is not a one and done, right? Is this answering your question? Yeah. Yeah. So clean up the old and bad. What I'm saying is, it should have turned into compost after six months. So whatever your organic material that you mulched with should have turned into compost after six months. If, okay, pine straw, okay. Pine straw is different. Pine straw is woody. So pine straw is, pine straw is different. Okay, pine straw is a great mulch, um, but just know that things will lay their eggs in, okay? So, yeah, pine straw is a little bit different. I mean, but at least clean up the debris. Okay, don't let the debris sit around. But pine straw is very good, and leaf mold is very good. I don't recommend anybody ever raking out leaf mold either. But, but anyway, clean up the junk from the dead and dying plants. Okay, that, that's the main thing. That's what these things are going to eat. All right? All right, so now we're going to go into mechanical and physical control methods. You know, we sell that planning guide over there. And I tell people the, the value of that planning guide, while it does tell you what to do day by day in your garden, the value of that planning guide is when you've used it for three years. 
because it has places to record things that you do. And so you can start recording when you plant things, what variety you plant, when it rains, when certain pests show up, when certain weeds show up. And then you start getting the knowledge to get ahead of these things, okay? So I tell people the best thing that people can put in their garden, and I'm out of Osmocote, but this is, this is the one hard and true gardening tip. What's the most important thing you can put in your garden? That's the second bucket. What? Your shadow. Ding, 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 ding. I wish I had more Osmocote. So the average gardener gardens five hours a week, okay? It depends on the size of your garden, but you can do a lot of good in five hours. If you ever watch a landscape crew, I tell people, observe, watch people. A landscape crew will come to your property, and they will not be there more than an hour, okay? Now, they might bring four or five people, so that means you're getting five man hours done in that one hour. So you can do a lot in that one hour. So that's what I'm saying. You need to take notes, and you need to start observing, and you need to start Writing things down, okay? I tell people, you, a good gardener grows stuff and all that, but a great gardener manages their garden. So it's just little tricks like getting that mulch out in January, recomposting in January and putting mulch on it. It's just little things that you learn like that from taking notes, observing when things pop up, so on and so forth. So we're going to talk about bugs real quick. So here's some mechanical physical control things in your garden. For bugs, who knows what those bugs are up there? That picture was actually taken here in Austin. Harlequin bugs. Okay, when do harlequin bugs come? When? Fall. They're primarily here in the fall, and what? They can be in the spring. I guess the right answer is not when do they come, it's what plants bring them in. Who knows what plants bring harlequin bugs in? Brassicas. Anything in the cold crops, right? So your broccoli, your cauliflowers, your kohlrabi, your Brussels sprouts. As soon as you plant those around here, there's a good chance that this bug is going to show up. Now this bug is a flying insect with a hard exoskeleton. So there's very few organic products that are going to kill this when it's a fully mature plant or insect like that. So the best thing that you can do is you can pick it off. Okay, you can pick it off. What this is, is Patty Leander, who's our vegetable specialist, she likes to put soapy water in a bucket and go out there and tap them into it. She doesn't like to pick them or whatever, but you see she, she gets a lot of bugs, okay? So that, that can be tedious. What you really want to do, if you're going to do an organic control, is you need to be ahead of things. You need to observe when these animals are going to show up, and then you need to start looking for their eggs. You need to get ahead of them because if you can scrape those eggs, and where are you going to find their eggs? Underneath. Underneath. 99% of the time, they're going to lay their eggs underneath that plant, the leaves of that plant. So turn it over when you see them, scrape them off. That's the best way to stay up. That's much easier than lugging around a five-gallon bucket full of water and soapy water and, and all of that, okay? So stay on top of it. And you can do things like aphids and scales, just blah, blah, blah. Aphids are the biggest horticultural and vegetable problem in the world. They do more damage to horticultural and vegetable crops than anything else. Spray them with water, hard water, um, that, that kind of controls them. But can you spray them and, and forget them? So if you're going to do any of these organic programs, you're going to have to be diligent. Okay. Now, I could go out there with a malathion, and I could spray a malathion, and I don't have to worry about it for three or four weeks, right? But then what do I have to worry about? <laughs> Eating malathion, right? Because the malathion is going to stay, especially if you spray things like broccoli and cauliflower that you can't wash it off of, right? So you have to be diligent, and you have to stay on top of it. My favorite one here, absolutely my favorite one, and the reason I discovered this, and I've, I've really discovered this fairly recently, is I grow almost everything under cover, under row cover. Now, the reason I do this is because my wife and I live in the country, and she has a strict no-kill policy, okay? And because she has a strict no-kill policy, we have one of the finest collections of cotton-tail bunnies in Washington County. <laughs> and so they're just everywhere, okay? And I literally could not get a row of green beans to harvest 
because I planted, as soon as they pop up, the little bunnies would come in and eat it. And I had to do something. So I started going under cover. Now there's a lot of different covers, and you can do a lot of different things with it. The cover that I grow under primarily is a very lightweight cover, and it's strictly there to keep the bugs out. Okay, so it's thin, it will tear, you have to be kind of careful with it. But, you know, I run drip irrigation, so I water under the cover. And this is the best thing that I've found if you want to grow pretty, pretty plants, pretty vegetables, and keep the bugs off of them, this is the way to do it. So, but the next question that I always get, what's, what's the next question that should go under that? If I tell, what? How to get pollinated. Ding, 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 ding. Exactly right. How are you getting pollinated? How do you pollinate? What? Well, it all depends on the plant. Yes, ma'am. Ding, 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 ding. Green beans, self-pollinate. Tomatoes, self-pollinate. Okay, so many of our vegetables that we have, they self-pollinate. Root crops. Root crops don't need to pollinate. All right? A carrot doesn't need to pollinate. You eat the root, right? And so there's only very few things that actually need pollination, and those are your squashes, your cucumbers, things like that. And they're really kind of hard to grow under cover anyway, especially anything that binds, okay? But you can grow squash because what is one of the most horrible pests that a vegetable gardener around here can encounter? Squash vine borer, right? We hate this thing, right? Now, this is what I'm telling you. There's no control for it. And I have a friend, Skip Richter, who, um, he's our, our leading writer in there. He's trying to find, he's trying to create a control method for this. So there are chemical control methods for this if you are a commercial grower. Okay? But you can't even get access to them as a homeowner. So even if you wanted to spray your six squash plants with it, they won't sell it to you. And so he's trying to come up with a home deal. So what you have to do is you have to apply these either mechanical and physical uh, measures to keep them off of the plant. You have to scrape the eggs off when she shows up. But how are you going to know when she's showing up? You're going to have to be in the garden. Okay, She's typically going to show up in the morning and you're going to hear her. She sounds like a bumblebee. So she's a moth. You need to learn what she looks like. She's a little gray and orange moth and she buzzes like a bumblebee. And so if you're out there in the mornings and your squash is beginning to develop flower buds on it, you're going to start hearing it. And so at that point, you can make a decision whether you want to cover or not, or you can leave it uncovered and just, you know, spray the rags on. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm telling you is you need to be in your garden. You need to be observant. Mechanical berries and row covers are awesome. Now, another thing that I kind of like that are kind of fun, I like traps. And so I like sticky traps. How many people have ever been, you said you've been to a greenhouse. When you go to a greenhouse, you see these little yellow sticky pads all over everything, right? Now, just for fun, why are they yellow and not blue? Yellow and trap. More flowers in the world bloom yellow than any other color. So all insects are predisposed to like yellow. So that's why yellow sticky traps are yellow sticky traps. I tell people there is science in horticulture, okay? Uh, you just need to know it. You need to know why that is. So, you can buy yellow sticky traps on Amazon. You can buy sheets of them, eight and a half by 11, 100 sheets of them for like 15, 16 bucks. And then you can cut them into whatever size you want. As you see here, I put them on my tomato cages and they, they do a pretty decent job, okay? So that's yellow sticky pads. You can do saucers of beer for slugs and all of that. But one of the most fun is get you a big wash tub, get you a post, and key pose, whatever you want to write, rebar, and get like a shop light or a brooder light and clip on it and let that thing run at night over this puddle of water or this bucket of water that has soap in it. You go back in the morning, that thing's going to be full of dead and brown bugs. Okay? So that's a that's a pretty neat kind of a fun, fun trap. All right. So I always get the question though. How do you keep from killing the good bugs? Anybody have any idea? You don't, okay? So I tell people, who knows what C-I-D-E means? Herbicide, pesticide, 
What do you, what does that mean? It comes from a Latin root word that means to kill. Okay, so if you put out any kind of herbicide or pesticide, I don't care if it's organic or if it's chemical, it's not just going to kill the bad stuff. Okay, so that's why when you're doing these things, we're fixing to talk about chemical and biological control methods. Understand that any sign, whether it's organic or not, can kill stuff, right? So a lot of people think just because it's organic, it's good, right? Arsenic's organic, right? Y'all don't want to spray that in your garden, correct? So anyway, so on these chemical and biological control methods, we're going to use them as a last resort. Remember, they were at the tip of the pyramid. So they're going to be our final thing, and we're going to use them sparingly. We don't have a whole lot of things that we can use. But here are the bigger ones that you know. How many people have heard of Bt? The Cellus Theringiensis. That is the oldest one. People have known about Bt and it worked on salt body caterpillars for a very long time. I don't know how long exactly. It's a long time. They've known this. They've been spraying it for a very long time. This is for your salt body test. Somebody told me earlier this afternoon that they got a pretty good looking cauliflower, but the leaves are gone. Right, the leaves are probably gone by cabbage loppers. There's a good chance that those little inchworm looking green caterpillars, that's cabbage loppers. And that's probably what's done it, okay? BT will work on them, but it will only work on them if you get them when they're little. So if they get full grown, like you see in that picture up there, it's not gonna be very effective. So what you need to do, if you're gonna use these biological control methods is you need to learn the life cycle of these pests that you're going to try to kill. Aphids, okay, aphids are, Patty Leander likes to say, aphids are born pregnant. They're not really born pregnant, but they can start producing offspring in three days after they have. So they're almost born pregnant, okay? So what does that tell you? That means that if you're going to get ahead of a very bad aphid infestation, how often are you going to have to go and spray that plant? every three days for a while right so and that's the difference between an organic control method and a systemic or a chemical or whatever because yeah so malathion or some of these others they don't knock them out for a week two weeks three weeks or whatever but the reason we're growing organically is because we don't want that we don't want those in our in our diet basically right another thing about the organics not only do you have to stay on them but you these are living organisms, and sunlight will degrade them very quickly. So if you're mixing this to spray, you don't want to take a five-gallon sprayer out there, mix up five gallons, and say, I'm going to spray every day for a week. Because a lot of these organics are only going to be viable for 24 to 48 to 72 hours. So when you spray this stuff, read the directions. It will tell you how long you can mix it up. It's much better to hook it up in a pint spray bottle and go out there and mix it every day than it is to put it in a five gallon sprayer and try to you know, reuse it for four days, okay? So that is a little drawback on some of the organics. Yeah, generally they're, yeah, so like BT is in our 48 hours, right? So I tell people you generally are gonna have to do any organic at least three times to get a result. Next one is spinosis. So spinosa kills a lot of really tough things. Leaf miners are kind of hard. It says it kills farmers, okay? I'm just gonna be honest with you. I've never found an organic control method that kills farmers, okay? What? Well, permethrin, permethrin is pyrethrin, yeah. It is technically an organic and all, it, and it has some effects. I mean, the spinosa will have, have some effects. Yeah, I don't, I don't like spinosad on, on farms. I mean, yeah, yeah, and it's, and it's good for other stuff too. That, so, anyway, it is good. It is technically organic. It is, it is a good pesticide. So, very good. I do like it. So, all right. So spinosad, though, it is a live bacterium. When it gets on these things, it speeds up their metabolism and it kills them. But once again, this is not something that's going to break down in heat. So you can't mix this stuff up and store it and go back and spray every three or four days out of a five-gallon container. 
The other thing is that it definitely kills bees. So a lot of people, you know, a lot of the reason we do this organic stuff is that we're trying to protect the pollinators. And so, like I said, any chemical or any herbicide or pesticide method, it is going to kill beneficials. You know, so the bees and the butterflies, they get all of the press as being the, the pollinators that we want to, you know, protect and all of that. But they're not the only things that are out there pollinating the plants, right? I mean, wasps, seraphid flies, you know, solitary bees. There's a whole lot of things that we don't even know about the seed that are out there. And when you spray this stuff, it will kill some of the good stuff as much as some of the bad stuff. That's why they say use it last and use it spraying, sparing. Did you have a question now? Okay. So here's another one thing that I'm kind of on the fence about. So I do like sprays like neem oil. Um, how many of y'all have used neem? Neem is a very nice product. Now I tell people, why, anybody want to tell me why neem works? There, there's two things that neem has going about it. All of the horticultural oils, what we'll call neem, one of them, they are an oil. Okay, so they are actually an oil that will coat an organism. Many of these organisms actually respire through their skins, through their coats, through their legs, whatever. And so it clogs that and suffocates. But another thing that people don't really think about on neem, I like to tell people, and we'll talk about some homemade concoctions here in a minute. If you want to grow a pest-free vegetable garden, what do you want to grow? What? Well, that's a little harsh, but if you want to grow a pest-free vegetable garden, grow a limb, grow onions, grow garlics, grow leeks, okay? Nothing eats them. We're the only thing that eats them, okay? Deer won't even eat them. I mean, and I'm not kidding, okay? Because a lot of animals are repelled by a strong sense of smell. And so when we talk about these homemade concoctions, you know, we'll get into that. But neem is one of those, it has a very unique sp smell that a bunch of animals, it literally will repel them. So if it doesn't coat them, it actually will repel them because of its smell. But also know that neem, especially if you put too much neem, if you put too much neem like on a broccoli or whatever, and, and you go and consume that, a lot of people have a sensitivity to neem and some of these horticultural oils. So I also tell people when you're spraying this stuff, there's a thing, I can't recall them all off the top of my head, but you can Google it. You need to Google the dirty dozen. And these are the dirty dozen. These are the things that you definitely do not want to spray with a commercial herbicide or pesticide. And they are things like broccoli, cauliflower, things that have lots and lots of texture. I remember peaches. So you definitely don't want to spray these things that are hard to wash and wash the stuff off. You know, you can spray a plum with something and you can wash everything off the plum, but you can't wash it off the peach because of all the, all the fur or the skin. So, homemade concoctions. I get a whole lot of questions about homemade concoctions. And like I said, know why they work. I got how much? Ten. Ten minutes. Oh, good. I got about 40 minutes of material. So, <laughs> if, I, if I tell you to grow onions to get rid of all the pests, then no, the reason that the onions repel most pests is because of their smell. Most animals do not like the smell of onion. They don't like um, rosemary. There are certain things like that. So it doesn't really matter to me what your formula is that you make for your homemade spray. You make it however you want. You chop it up, you blend it, you boil it, you do whatever you need to. The main things that you need in it is you need water to disperse it, okay? Then you need some kind of oil to, like we say, coat some of these things. And then you need some soap. And then if you want to put a, a scent agent in there, put any scent agent that you want. A lot of people swear by peppers. Okay, most animals, they're immune to capsation. So you can put peppers in there, but it's there's a lot of animals that it doesn't bother them. They don't have the, the receptors. Okay. So put stuff that smells. Put your onion, your garlic, your rosemaries, things like that. And then why do we put water? I like, I mean, why do we put um, soap in the water? What is, everybody, you've heard this on everything. Put it in your bug traps. Put it in your homemade spray. Why do we use soap? It is a surfactant. What does that mean? It helps it to adhere to the surface. So it does two different things, right? 
So number one, it breaks surface tension. So it breaks the surface tension. So like, remember the um, Harlequin beetles that I showed that had dish soap in it? Why was the dish soap in it? Yeah. If we didn't put dish soap in it, those Harlequin bugs could walk on the surface of the water. So that broke the surface tension of the water and those bugs went in there and they drowned. Now, when you say it is a surfactant, surface is in that. So what that does is it breaks the water up into tiny, tiny little droplets. When you spray it, okay, if you don't have soap in it and you spray it, it's kind of like, you know, when you sneeze, you got big stuff and you got little stuff that comes out. So if you don't have the soap in it, everything that comes out of your squirt bottle is going to be big drops. Yes, sir. You mix soap and an oil? Okay. You do. You do. You don't put a lot of soap. Okay, everybody asks, how much soap do you put in there? You just put a couple of drops. We were told in one of the classes not to mix soap in with any oil. Yeah, why? Well, I'm curious. Uh, because it counteracts the fact that the oil, I mean, it, soap breaks up an oil. So it can, it can bind to an oil, okay? But I, I think we're talking, yeah, I don't know. I, I would argue that. I, but, but anyway, we're experts. yeah, we're just, we're just putting a little bit of soap in there because that soap is going to make it because that oil, so it's not going to break the oil up. Oil, soap cannot break up oil, but it will break it up in, from blobs into little bitty things. So if you'll take a drop of oil and drop it on top of water, watch what happens. As it spreads, okay? It doesn't stay together, but it does stay together kind of in clumps. And so if you'll put a little soap in there, my, my understanding is that it breaks that up even further. And so when those tiny moist, those tiny molecules go out, you get coated with a lot more. So if you spray somebody with a bunch of BBs or with a bunch of little micro things, you're going to get a much bigger covering with the micro stuff. So that's my thinking on it. I don't, I don't want to counteract what somebody told me, but I mean, I've always put oils and a little bit of soap. I always did too, until I, she said. Yeah, but anyway, just try it. Now, so the, this is the other thing, okay? And we'll talk about that. I tell people, learn who to trust, okay? So if this person has told you good information, there's no reason to doubt that person. And, and if, if it doesn't sound right to you, try it, okay? And I tell people, be, do this on the internet, too, because everybody's an expert on the internet. How many people look at Instagram and Facebook and all of that? How many gardening experts are there out there? Yeah, 12 billion, something, something, okay? You have to learn who you can trust. And, and go with it. I don't think that was bad advice, you know? And, and you can try it. I always tell people experiment, too. If you want to try something new, try it. That, that's why we bark. So, so anyway, oils, soap, water, and then something that smells bad. Generally, we'll repel most things. Okay, so we've already talked about don't let your weeds go to seed, don't plant them close together. Drip irrigation provides the weeds of water. This is another reason I'm a big fan of drip irrigation. Um, really, really use it. So now we're gonna get down to my final favorite, favorite, favorite thing. And this is so important. We said the first thing that you could put in your garden that's super important was your shadow. The second thing is mulch. You literally cannot over mulch a garden, okay? You cannot put too much mulch in a garden. Now, how you apply it is up to you. How many people have heard of lasagna gardening and all that? There's a million ways to get organic matter into your soil and, and get growing in it, okay? The point is, get it out there. It does many, many things to it. So I asked you earlier, what do plants need to live? Water, sunlight, right? So, what? Micro, macro nutrients and all that. Compost does all of that, okay? So compost can mean, or mulch, I'm, I'm talking about mulch right now. But a lot of people, I can't even mulch with compost because I have access to mushroom mulch that comes from the farm in Madisonville. <clears throat> but you can mulch with whatever organic thing that you want, but mulch, mulch, mulch. If you look there in my picture, the best thing that I tell people, if you want to be effective with your mulch, is you want something that's going to block, first of all, all the light. Okay, if a plant does not get light, it will not germinate. And remember how we were talking about the weed seeds earlier, that when, you know, one year of, of seeds equals seven years of weeds? Seeds, nature is an amazing thing, and those seeds get in your soil, and they don't all germinate the first year. Okay, they have different, by design, they have different thicknesses of seed cups. 
So if you've ever put out unscarified blue bonnet seeds, you'll find out that you won't get a big rush of blue bonnets the first year. You'll get a few blue bonnets here and a few blue bonnets there, and then the next year you'll get some more in, in some different places, okay? But that's why they scarify blue bonnet seeds, right? Y'all know what scarify is? You know what I'm talking about? Because blue bonnet seeds, all plants are designed to extend their genetics into the future. And this is the only way that they can do that is by not doing all of their germination in one season, right? Because what happens? Sometimes in February it gets five degrees. Sometimes in July it burns everything to the ground, right? So mulch, 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 mulch. The first thing that we're trying to do with mulch when we're talking about weed control is we're trying to deprive them of the light they need to germinate. That's what you do. So most effective for me, the things that I've had best luck with, Newspaper or cardboard, put that down first. That's going to almost guarantee that that stuff is blocked. And then put your mulch on top of it because the cardboard and the paper will, will break down eventually and become organic material itself. So all of this stuff is good. So pine needles. Pine needles are awesome because pine needles last a long time. And pine needles actually make kind of an organic carpet. Or whatever. In fact, pine needles are, are awesome. And that's why everything grows so well in East Texas, is because they have tons of them. So if you can get pine needles, they're awesome. They are an awesome, awesome mulch for depriving life to the weeds and the seed bank under the soil. Now, another one. Earlier, somebody said, Who said they got a, a torch for Christmas to burn their weeds? Who said, there, there you are. So, this is one of my favorite weed control, organic weed control tips. Sally and I have tons of decomposed granite um, walkways all throughout our property. And so trying to be organic with those, I have what's called a no-pull burner. I assume that's what you're talking about on your torch. It's a big torch that hooks up to a propane tank. And I used to walk along my decomposed granite walkways, and I would burn the weeds. Now, you don't even have to burn the weeds. You don't have to burn them up. What you're trying to do is you're just trying to melt the cuticle that covers them. So you just have to heat them up until they change their appearance, and then they'll respire themselves. So anyway, I'm killing these weeds, and I'm not paying attention, and I turned around, and I forgot that I was in my vegetable garden. And I bought mulched my vegetable garden with hay. And all of a sudden, I had my whole vegetable garden on fire, and I was screaming, Sally was screaming. Um, so I will tell you, while fire might be the most fun organic weed control tip, you do definitely need to be careful with it. So, but I'm gonna tell you the other thing. Everybody gripes about Texas heat, right? I guess if you're from New Jersey, you're gonna gripe about the snow, and if you're from here, you're gonna gripe about the heat, right? Well, instead of griping about the heat, I tell people, use the weed, the heat to kill your weeds. How many people have ever solarized? To me, this is awesome. This is awesome. So mow whatever problem area you have is close to the ground, saturate it, put down some kind of opaque plastic material, seal it around the edges, do this when it's hot, June, July, August, and walk away. A month is generally good enough, three months is definitely long enough, and this will heat the soil up. I'm gonna tell you a magic number. Magic number in horticulture is 140 degrees, all right? How many people have made compost? When you make compost, what are you trying to do? You're trying to raise your compost pile to what? To 140 degrees, because what happens at 140 degrees? It kills almost everything living, okay? 140 degrees will kill you, and I'm not kidding. If you get in the oven and set it for 140 <laughs> degrees, you're not gonna last for very long. All right, and so it will kill bugs, it will kill seeds, it will kill bacteria, it will kill fungi. So that's what you're trying to do with this. You're trying to raise the temperature of the soil under there to 140 degrees, and that will kill anything in the soil where you get to 140 degrees. Okay, you're shooting for six inches because that's where most of these seeds are. Like when you hand till and everything, you know, you're not generally tilling more than six inches. And those are the weeds that you're going to turn up, most likely. So you want to get it on there, raise that temperature 140 degrees, 6 inches deep. I really do believe this is one of the best organic weed control tips there is. The other one that I tell people is smothering. So with smothering, 
we're, we're using heat up here to deprive and kill these things. With smothering, we're definitely using the lack of light and the lack of water to kill things, right? So people ask me, if you're going to smother, use something big and heavy, use hardy plank, use boards or whatever. I can tell you what is the absolute best smothering agent in the world, and it is a 40-foot shipping container. Okay, when Sally and I remodeled our house, we got a 40-foot shipping container and put it in our backyard, and we put all our furniture in there, and we left it out there for a year. After the remodel was done, we moved all the furniture back in, they came and got the shipping container, and for five years, we could see a 40-foot rectangle in our backyard. <laughs> so I'm telling you, it is effective, and, uh, and, but just realize, it really is very, very effective. All right, chemical weed control. And this is probably it. Am I it? Okay. So chemical weed control. Go to your local nurseries. You know, I, I am a big fan of local nurseries. These people make their money on repeat business. They're not going to lie to you. They're going to give you good advice, sell you good products. Acetic acid. Everybody says kill weeds with acetic acid. What is acetic acid? It's vinegar, right? Household vinegar is 6% acetic acid. If you pour that on your plants, they'll probably faint. Okay? It's not strong enough to kill really tough weeds. So you need to go to your, your local nursery and you need to buy horticultural acetic acid. So you can get it in 16, 18, 20, 24, and 30 percent. But I do tell people this is like the organic roundup. So if you spray horticultural acetic acid at 20 or 30 percent, it will kill plants. And what I tell that is because if you don't use a shield or whatever, you will kill plants you don't want to kill. Okay? So another one that's funny and kind of cracks me up, this is one of those experiments. I read on a fairly reputable site that horticultural molasses would kill nutsack. And I said, okay, I'm going to try it. Okay? So I went to my nursery, I got some horticultural molasses, and I am proud to say that after putting a $20 bottle of horticultural molasses on one nutset plant, I killed it. So, I would say I don't recommend that, but supposedly that, that will help kill it. And then boiling water, that kind of cracks me up. I mean, rain in Texas is kind of boiling. So I haven't had much luck with that. But the acetic acid is good. So y'all, that's it. Thank you for having us. Like I say, if you don't take our magazine, come talk to us. Master Gardener, 25% discount. Um, and if you ever have any gardening uh, questions, one thing I will tell you, follow us on, if you follow on Facebook and Instagram, follow us. We do tips every Wednesday. We promote upcoming events and all of that. And if you ever have any questions, call us. Sally and I love to talk gardening. We talk gardening all day, every day. So if you have any questions, feel free to call us. And thank you all for having us. questions, but we'd be here till 10 o'clock. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. So, if y'all have questions, yeah, yeah. So we'll move in if you've got questions. Thank you for being here. Good to see everybody. Um, see you next month. What does he have for his mom?